this, uh, this paper that I'm going to deliver this evening, it's, I guess, and it's an expansion of, a, of an article recently published in Art Forum in the summer edition, and a printed version of this uh, will appear in a publication that JPR Ringier are preparing uh, for May 2014, which is in conjunction with an exhibition of Carl's poems in the Museum Zoo Aller Heligen in Schaffhausen uh, in Switzerland. In 1959, saw the invention of the integrated circuit, or microchip, and the birth control pill. It brought forth the space race, the computer revolution. It witnessed the rise of pop art, free jazz, some of which you heard as you were coming in this evening, um, and independent cinema, the emergence of Fidel Castro and Malcolm X, the beginnings of Motown and the commencement of Alan Capra's happenings all framed against the backdrop of the Cold War and the first American casualties in Vietnam. It was against this backdrop that Carl Andre made two major contributions to modern art and began work on a third. In 1959, Carl Andre completed the negative sculpture Last Ladder and on Frank Stella's request composed the short text preface to stripe paintings for the catalog of the exhibition 16 Americans at the Museum of Modern Art. Last Ladder has reached an almost mythic status in accounts of Andre's work largely because its unworked qualities were seen to anticipate the way that the vast majority of his later works were made from materials that were unaltered by the artist. His statement for Stella, beginning with art excludes the unnecessary, has become a benchmark account of minimalism and arguably herald its arrival. Matching these extraordinary contributions to modern art was Andre's move in 1959 from earlier experiments with poetry towards a more formed, dense, and ultimately vastly influential style. I want to give attention this evening to his poets, to his poetry's correspondences with the traditions of 20th century American poetry, in that much like the great innovators of the 20th century American poetry, such as Robert Frost, Wallace Stevens, William Carlos Williams, and Ezra Pound, Andre's poems are charged with history, cultural illusions, the collective unconscious, and inscribed with the socio-linguistic palette of their time. In 1968, Robert Smithson described Andre's poetry as a method that smothers any reference to anything other than words. Thoughts crushed into a rubble of syncopated syllables. Reason becomes a powder of vowels and consonants. His words hold together without any sonority. The apparent sameness and tonelessness ordering of Andre's poems conceals the disorientation of grammar. Paradoxically, his words, in parentheses, are charged with all the complication of oxymoron and hyperbole. Each poem is a grave, so to speak. Semantics are driven out of his language in order to avoid meaning. In my opinion, Andre's poetry does not always do what Smithson suggests largely because it is virtually impossible to write a poem that is and only is an object to behold as a static object without meaning, without message even. Andre himself has validated this when in 1979 he stated, it is impossible to make art devoid of human associations because the essence of art is human association. Furthermore, Smithson's suggestion of the absence of self by material literality is undermined by the frequent personal and political subject matter applied by André and the fluency with which he adopts different poetic form. I'd like to suggest that many of André's poems are a constellation of self, assembling complex historical, political and personal narratives within an astonishing diversity of poetic form. In other words, they are not simply linguistic tombs, and they are not just abstract visual poems following Mallarmé's model, but that they exist in a tantalizing space somewhere between the established categories and forms of poetry 
and those of minimalism's often stoic remove and as such maintain an elusive status. Throughout his career, André has repeatedly emphasized the materiality and non-referentiality of his sculpture. And, he, and I quote, My work is atheistic, materialistic, and communistic. It's atheistic because it's without transcendent form, without spiritual or intellectual quality. Materialistic because it's made without pretension to other materials. And communistic because the form is equally accessible to all men. This interpretation of a sculpture persists to the present day, when in 2013, in an interview on BBC Four's Today programme, Andre stated, I find that I have a very good audience with small children, because they don't ask what it means. My work doesn't mean anything, it's just the presentation of materials in the clearest form I can make it. Early on, Andre did draw parallels between his approach to sculpture and that of his poetry, an analogy adopted by many subsequent writers on his practice. For instance, for his written contribution to the catalogue for Kiniston McShine's now iconic exhibition Primary Structures, Younger American and British Sculptors, held at the Jewish Museum in 1966, Andre submitted Lever Words, here on the right, 1966, a poem of four stanzas on a single page. The work is composed exclusively of four-letter nouns paratactically arranged in a format suggestive of Lever, the sculpture he was exhibiting in the show. The multiple word composition, beginning with beam and ending with room, was in, a part, was in part a response to, one, to the 137 fire bricks extending from the gallery wall, thereby proposing a way to read Lever. Um, it, was, it was in fact Smithson who said that, uh, who used this term uh, in relation to Andre's, to, to, to his poetry, that, that it was a way to, to read um, the, the, the sculpture. In this early work, Andre suggested um, that there was a direct correlation between the sculpture and its eponymous poem. Andre's poem's correspondences with his sculptural configurations continued to be highlighted by a number of close friends, such as, Holl such as writer and filmmaker Hollis Frampton, and, as already mentioned, Smithson, who, amongst other things, identified connections between both kinds of work, including self-referentiality, particularly in relation to material, seriality, geometry, and the use of the whole space, whether room or page. This connection persisted in many interpretations of Andre's work, um, and for example, of the rolling verse in 100 Sonnets, um, I Flowers, 1963, Chinadi's associate director, Rob Wiener, notes that the repetition of single words commands the page by forming a sequence of fields directly relating to the places created by Andre's metal floor work. There is undoubtedly a strong case for reading Carl's poems in relation to his sculptural output, but I want to argue that to do so restricts our understanding of these works to a certain extent. While minimal sculpture represents one influence on the poems, they also have their roots in modernist poetry, a line of influence that has not yet been adequately explored. By considering André's poems in relation to this rich linguistic heritage, we are able to move beyond the somewhat limiting comparisons with the sculpture that have shaped their critical reception to date. The poems evoke a literary tradition that spans the 20th century through to our present moment. André simultaneously embodies and resists this poetic inheritance, ultimately creating an ars poetica of his own. Even the non-referentiality of some of André's poems, which art historically informed readers and audiences such as yourselves, will associate with the autonomy of the minimal object, can be traced to a development in modernist poetry. Archibald MacLeish's 1926 poem, Ars Poetica, from which I shamelessly adopted the last concluding point of that paragraph, decisively outlined a new poetic aesthetic which would go on to become known as Imagism. Imagism was a movement in early 20th century Anglo-American poetry that favored precise, clear, sharp language and simultaneously advocated, an idea that, was, that simultaneously is advocated for MacLeish and demonstrated by the poem, which I'm going to read for you now. <clears throat> 
A poem should be palpable and mute as a globed fruit, dumb as old medallions to the thumb, silent as the sleeve-worn stone of casement ledges where the moss has grown. A poem should be wordless as the flight of birds. A poem should be motionless in time as the moon climbs, leaving as the moon releases twig by twig the night-entangled trees, leaving as the moon behind the winter leaves, memory by memory the mind. A poem should be motionless in time as the moon climbs. A poem should be equal to, not true, for all the history of grief, an empty doorway and a maple leaf, for love, the leaning grasses and two lights above the sea, a poem should not mean, but be. Several aspects of Ars Poetica could be applied to Andre's early poems, their palpability and muteness, their emphasis on visual imagery over linguistic communication, their prioritization of stasis over narrative development and of being over meaning. Interestingly, when drafting his poems, MacLeish laid out his words on gridded notepaper so he could visualize the appearance of the poem on the page and maintain his desired rhythm and pace. Andre's poems are either handwritten on gridded paper or structured according to the predetermined grid of the typewriter. This shares certain aspects of MacLeish's methodology in addition to his interest in the facticity of the spoken, written, or typed word. In poetry, one of the best-known examples of imagism is William Carlos Williams' 1923 poem, The Red Wheel Barrow. The Red Wheel Barrow. So much depends upon a red wheel barrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. On The Red Wheel Barrow, Williams has said, we shouldn't forget that poems are made of line breaks, cuts, as well as words. And so much depends in this poem on the splitting of the two compound words, wheelbarrow and rainwater. These dissections slow us down and help the mind's eye to register more. The individual wheels, as well as the body of the barrow, the water that is more than raindrops. Once read, the red wheelbarrow is difficult to dismiss. The poem appears in front of you, more or less intact. Its overall shape and inner patterns, as well as its key images, are stamped upon the brain. A similar effect occurs in Andres, a man carrying a saxophone, illustrated here on the left. Um, I do apologize for the, but they're just so difficult to, to, to reproduce, um, but I will read it for you. A man carrying a saxophone, a man carrying a saxophone under his arm on Washington Park, an old man. Like the red wheel barrow, the line breaks are as important as the words which serve to imprint a singular image in the mind's eye. The words arm, park and man used by Andre are tools which serve to reinforce the central image of the saxophone, just as rainwater on William's wheelbarrow helps to delineate its contours for the reader. Moving on from the poetic tradition of imagism, we might consider Andre's relationship to post-linear poetry of the 1930s. In his famous poem, Or P-O-P-H-E-S-S-A-G, Or, 1935, an anagram of Grasshopper, E. E. Cummings dismantles language, stripping out syntax and syllables to leave only the incomprehensible babble of glossolalia. In Iconic Dimensions in Poetry, Richard Wasso suggests Cummings coined language that smashed words and sensory impressions together up against the act of articulation. If we follow the sequence of letters that makes most sense, thus we have to read the first word from right to left rather, from left, rather than left to right, our reading process follows lines of motions that map diagrammatically the elusive haphazard jumps and flights of a grasshopper. Thus we move to the left, to the right, to the left, etc., and follow words, syllables, or letters that hop down one or two lines, jump over typographic voids, skip up to capitals and down to small letters, are interrupted by stops and reversals. The word grasshopper itself wildly hops around in the poem, leaping lines, landing in the middle of a word or a sentence. Even the title of the poem has hopped from its proper place in line 7 to line 15, grasshopper.
But the reading process also involves the progressive unscrambling or unraveling of the different and successive, le successively less scrambled words for grasshopper. Quite apart from offering various on onomatopoeic icons for the grasshoppers whirring and chirruping, the sequential unscrambling of the on, on the part of the reader is an iconic imitation of the gradual change in the perceiving subject of a gradually firmer perceptual grasp of the nature and identity of the evasive object called grasshopper. Hence, the initially slow and laborious act of rearranging the letters can be seen as a reenactment of the process of perception that bundles disparate sensory impressions into a meaningful whole. The progressive recognition of the poem genre as a titled sonnet matches this process in terms of its poetic form. Oh, actually, just while we're on that, this image on the left is, is um, extremely interesting, which is, it's a proof sheet that Cummings sent um, to the Brazilian translator, Augusto de Campos, and um, he sent it because he, when he received back the print of how his poem was going to appear in, the, in, in its first edition in Brazil, they had, arranged, they had arranged, rearranged it for him. And he was like, oh, oh no, and he sent this incredibly detailed um, uh, note back and said if they couldn't, if their printer couldn't deal with it, they weren't to, they weren't to print the poem. And um, interestingly, uh, uh, Augusto de Campo, as I'm sure many of you know, along with his brother Geraldo, ended up um, forming... Uh, um, uh, or, or they founded concrete, the Concrete Poetry Movement in Brazil, um, and otherwise known as the Nogueras Group. So there's a very interesting uh, uh, where they miss the, the, the idea of misreading things that were sent. So the cognitive process that results in the eventual detachment of the figure and grasshopper from the perplexing, seemingly chaotic ground of Cummings' typography is paralleled and reinforced in the iconic level of spatial configuration. For if we look at his poem picture, as if it were a picture puzzle, we discover the rough outline of a grasshopper facing right. So you can, this is a, on the right hand side is, is taken from this, this publication on iconic poetry and it's a, a kind of illustration, a diagram of how the grasshopper fo also forms itself within the poem. So you can see the hind leg, the antenna, wing, head, eye, and, and, and front claw. In short, the puzzling difficulties of the cognitive process of clearly grasping a jumping insect's position in the grass, uh, its species, or indeed its name, of its, uh, as its outward form are given expression in this virtuoso poem by Cummings. In Andre's 1963 poem, Intimate, fragmentary meditations on poetry and travel take the form of a preambulating figure. Uh, this is the work on the left-hand side. Without cohering into any kind of narrative, the words conjure the fleeting impressions and memories that assail the mind during the physical act of walking. As with Cummings' Grasshopper, the movement, the movement of the eye around the page, the various routes available through the poem, and the reader's attempts to reassemble its disparate elements capture a sense of a body, but here also a human mind in motion. Andre does not disassemble individual words in the same way as Cummings, although he did so in other poems of this period, such as Blue on the right, 1959. But the fragmentary sentences of Intimate similar, similarly demand a kind of active readership, whereby the reader is forced to assemble and construct their own meanings from the linguistic rubble that constitutes the poem. André does play with word dispersion in his poems Particles of Johnson, 1963, on the left, and Triumphal Entry of Christ into Jerusalem, 1964, and Quincy Bay, 1964. In Particles of Johnson, it is probable he is making reference to the laws of dissipation in motion 1918 by Ernst Johnson. In order to explain the physical aspect of the universe, Johnson proposed that matter consists of separate particles tied together by forces in such a manner that when the particles move, motion is transmitted from one to another. It is also conceivable Andre is making reference to the use of particle in a grammatical sense 
in that a, a particle is a kind of function word that is not changeable but lacks a precise lexical definition. In Triumphal Entry of Christ into Jerusalem, 1964, biblical names converge and overlap in a way that, like Cummings Grasshopper, initially appear quite meaningless. But as we move through the poem, it becomes apparent that these names and the relationships between them are signposts in a narrative that is reconstructed in the act of reading. In the Bible, Bethany was the name of a village near Jerusalem, the home of the siblings Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and according to the Gospel of John, the site of a miracle in which Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Zacchaeus, which means pure and righteous one, was a tax collector hated by the Jews, but after Jesus addressed him directly, he publicly represented or repented, um, excuse me, he publicly repented acts of corruption and vowed to make restitution for them. Jerusalem is a linguistic hybrid of Jerusalem and Bethlehem, while Salalimili is a conflation of Salem and Jerusalem and Galilee, and so Jerusa David is a tangle of Jerusalem and David. Here, the fragmentary arrangement of the poem on the page, when analysed, reveal itself to be a comprehensive description of the biblical tale. In this rhythmic incantation, the words stutter and resound, and insisting upon the sonority of the spoken word. Quincy Bay positions words familiar with the description of a bay, blue, sea, water, salt, gulls, islands, sand, and tide, with more incongruous words like condoms and rat, together with the colloquialism clammy. Each word, like flotsam and jetsam, bobs along the page. Maybe they map precise longitude and la latitude and longitude coordinates of features of Quincy Bay, such as Moon Island, or mark certain memories from times spent there. Indeed, it would be a mistake to judge André's audio autobiographical poems as trivial or insignificant in relation to his output. Autobiography 1, for instance, is a fascinating alphabetically ordered system repeated eight times that intermingles beach resorts, sites of labor, family members, unspecified individuals, and names of iconic artists that recall the narrative scene setting of Francis, Robert Francis's silent poem. Home Thought, here on the right-hand side, uh, from the 25th of March, 1964, is a moving, emotionally charged poem that pits the impulse for independence against the deep-seated sense of duty to one's family. And I'm going to read this one to you too. What can I say to my mother? What can I say to my father? What can I say to my sisters and nephews and nieces? That I follow pleasure or harshness keeps me away or I follow a calling or the road lends, leads me away. No, none of them are answers. I have to find what to say. In conclusion, I'd like to return to Robert Smithson's account of the self-referentiality of André's poems and the analogies with the sculptures that have dominated their critical reception. André, as we know, was a close friend and great admirer of Smithson, and it seems likely that Smithson's influential reading of the poems, um, which I read out at the beginning, had a great impact on André himself. This emphasis on the materiality of language was perhaps one factor that caused André to negate the influence of modernist poetry on his, on his work, but in recent years he has been more open about, the set, about these set of influences admitting the importance of writers such as Gertrude Stein, E. E. Cummings, William Carlos Williams, Charles Olson, and Ezra Pound for his practice. I hope the poetic influences I have mapped tonight might enable us to move beyond reading the poems through the sculptures and towards an acknowledgement of their distinctive literary properties. In 1989, an exhibition of both parts of André's practice was held at Paula Cooper Gallery in New York, and was titled, Words as Poems, Matter as Sculpture. The title might be productively juxtaposed with Smithson's 1966 statement, language to be looked at and or things to be read. 
which conflates words and things looking and reading. By contrast, Andre's 1989 exhibition title reasserts the difference between the two, presenting the poems as a distinctive practice in their own right. Perhaps the naming of this exhibition finally marked a distinction for Andre himself, and in doing so, he irrefutably defends a declaration made some 14 years earlier in Poetry, Vision, Sound, specifically, um, and I quote, I have never been able to do absolute nonsense poetry. People may think that this poetry of mine is absolute nonsense, but I have never been able to use non-words or invented words. And for me, um, we might usefully interpret his use of the word nonsense to describe some of the purely visual, um, uh, for instance, calligrams or concrete poetry, or aural strands, um, such as letterism, of poetry that emerged in the 20th century. Andre continues, other people have done that and tend to make music out of language, but for me, the poetic interest in language is exactly the palpability, the tactile sense of the words themselves. And again, my interpretation of this from a, po from a poetry perspective, this is a classic statement um, about a love of words, their shape and structure, but also their meaning. And finally, Andre says, I have been accused of trying to treat words as things, though I know very well that words are not things, but words do have palpable tactile qualities that we feel when we speak them, when we write them, or when we hear them, and this is the real subject of my poetry. The final line invites an in-depth investigation, or for me at least, the final line invites an in-depth investigation of Andre's poetic oeuvre through the lens of modernist poetry, comparing and contrasting their oral qualities, their formal arrangements, and their careful choice of words. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, for now, at least, the, the conversations we have been having, I've been having with the artists, have focused upon um, um, Anglo-American poetry of the 20th century. Um, and he has also um, made reference to Poe and to Walt Whitman, I guess, and surprisingly, and, and people who come a generation earlier. But as I guess as a way for myself to grapple with, with this Sisyphean task of, 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 of Andre's poems, we've been kind of using it as a beginning parameter. But it's definitely an ongoing conversation. Um, I say huge task because um, at last count is about 2,000 poems. And we're discussing every single one of them. Um, so it's kind of a way to, to put para yeah, kind of a self-imposed guidelines, really. I was wondering about the currency of mine, I mean, whether it was in Smithson's library. Mm. 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 Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Undoubtedly, yeah. Un un undi undoubtedly. Um, and increasingly, and well, Smithson featured heavily in the talk this evening, but increasingly, um, that is his relationship with, with, with Robert is becoming a big part of of this conversation. And, um, John, what about the way he prefers his work to be encountered? Does he prefer it to be um, encountered on the page, or um, I mean, obviously it's, it is displayed in galleries. So, does he have mm. a preference for how it's actually? Um, well, one answer to that might be, and, and again, it goes against what Smithson was saying, that they kind of, they, 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 do, they don't, they, there's no aural quality to them. That for, for Carl, definitely, some of them are, were made to be read, and, and, and the, in fact, the majority of them were made to be read out. Um, he did do a reading of the poems in Oxford, um, and there is a recording of that available. And he has done readings of the poems, but very little. 
Um, I'm trying to uh, set, up situ set up situations where I'm recording him reading the poems, as many of them as possible, so that that can be documented. Um, so that's one way of receiving them, is by, is by hearing them being, being read. Um, the, yeah, I guess he, they were made as individual things, and in the, again, in the 60s, he, he, he's down as saying that he never wanted the, the, the poems to be compiled together in one compendium. But I, I just think his, his point of view has changed on that as things as time has passed and I guess for me I see great value in, in seeing them all together um, so it'll be a two volume publication with a, uh, of a thousand pages each and each of the poems will be, will be reproduced one to one they're all by and large on, on American legal paper is, is he still writing? no no the last one was a poem um, in 2000, um, a, which is about George W. Bush. And if I can recall it, it is simply George W. Bush, the boot heel of our nation. <laughs> um, and that, is, that was it, and he hasn't made it. But he, there, 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 there was poems made uh, in... But, they really, the majority of the works are made between 51 and 79. Because it was still a novel. He, it's, he, had that, he wanted that to be displayed flat, didn't he? Because the shade that he's got it, they always display it in the tree. Yeah, the sh and yeah the sh the, he, he, when he arrived originally in New York and he, before, well, it was Frampton who introduced him to Stella and he ended up becoming very good friends with Stella. And, um, but he really, he was, a, you know, he, was a, he saw himself as a poet and moved in particular circles and he wanted, but it was only later that the artistic practice kind of began to, began to dominate. Um, Although, as I mentioned this evening, that lever words was a very key moment for him, this kind of where those things were pitted against w w one another. Um, but so I guess the act of looking at them like that, as they would be presented maybe in a, in a not in a kind of, well, nowadays it's very tr fashionable to present things in vitrines, but may, you know, I think not in a, in a flat like that suited him for them to be seen like that. Um, but the, re the reading, I think, for him, what's important is that people do read them, you know, and they're not just... Because the, I guess a lot of the questions that have been directed to me have been about their relationship to concrete poetry, but there are a number of very basic things why they differ from concrete poems, and that is they... Because he only ever used two typewriters, they, the, the, scale, the, the letters all, all are of the same format, and they don't kind of differ hugely in scale. So he, where concrete poetry, that w it was about this kind of use of more, more playful use, I guess, of, of, of typography and uh, how things appeared on the page. So they do diverge. They do diverge from concrete poetry. They also, they also diverge from the sculpture in a, in a, in a major way, I think. Um, even though I think the work that has been done on that Particularly by James Meyer and Alistair Ryder, and you know the this idea of of their closeness and proximity to the sculpture, it's undoubtedly there. But I think there's something there's something else to be explored. Uh, has anyone looked at any correlation with John Cage's poetry? Yeah. And, and yeah, like Cage was someone who who Carl is certainly or who he he's very interested in, but I I haven't yet gone there yet. Like I think I'm it's my because I come from a, 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 an art background. My impulse is always to be, I'm kind of like a magnet drawn to the kind of where there's visual correspondences with things in the in the in the art world. But I'm trying to resist that and spend more time in 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 the world of poetry and trying to meet individuals from those 
that field of specialty and trying to see where those correspondences is lie. But I think there are met like there are you know there are there are there are some really fascinating correspondences, but other you know, vi- artists who are working in the visual field, I guess. But I'm re I I'm really interested in the language. I'm really interested in I'm I'm really trying to see if there is a potential to kind of frame them within the world of poetry, exclu not well not exclusively, but you know. Mm. The performance of it, Kevin. Yeah. 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 And he did say, interestingly, he, he said, um, oh, they're not drawings. And I said, no, that's okay. I said, it's a, <laughs> this is a very one, great institution that does things. And he was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> he did, it's one of the occasions when he was asked for a drawing, but it's more difficult to get his hands on them. Yeah. 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 Works on paper. Yeah. Well, MoMA, MoMA's definition of a drawing is a unique work on paper, so I guess they are, uni- they are unique works on paper. But, you know, I, I think one, one, one thing I'm very interested in is the technology of, um, of, of how they were made, and, and, I, and it might be some kind of parallel investigation. Is So the use of the typewriters... And these these kind of triple sheets where you would put in, and there was there was like a ostensibly three sheets of paper with a carbon sheet in between, and I can just about remember the, those machines, and then you would work away, and then there would be a duplicate created and a triplicate, um, and I, I really want to know more about that because and and. Um, you know, as as te- as I kind of touched, I just barely touched upon like the changes that have happened in technology since the 50s. But as you go into the 60s and 70s, then of course Xerox had a very famous um, artist residency program where they invited artists to come in, and, and in a way it was a type of drawing, I guess, because you know it was lit, it was ink in these machines, and 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 um, artists were were playing with it as as a kind of tool. So. I can un- I can also see how people would read them as, as as drawings or as unique works on paper, but he's he 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 seemed pretty pretty clear that they were they weren't they weren't drawings that they were poems. Um, you mentioned um, drawings and poems. Um, can you tell me what his attitude was to you know, how uh, you know, typewriters were later stamped out on the. Uh, excuse me. The, the letters stamped out on the. On a, on a piece of paper from a stamp, from a stamp letter, and the Xerox one is sort of like a picture of a letter. Mm. Can you tell well, me what, he what de- do you think about a picture of a letter and a stamp of a letter? You know, because mm. like Remington, you know, they they kind of made, uh, you know, they switched from making rifles to typewriters and mm. sort of like a stamp on a stamp really fast, like a horse. Well, you, know, you get a picture of a letter, it's very different. Well, one of the most famous um, descriptions, or, or, or yeah, descriptions of how he made the poems uh, with well, he always he always says that he only made them with one finger, and uh, this finger, his right index finger, because he didn't he doesn't do this, but it's just it's like, and so that mechanical way of making the poems uh, is very interesting and, and, and James Meyer for instance t- picks that up as does Rudy Fuchs and various other scholars as this way in this machine like way in which he was making the poems and, and that drew them then back to their relationship with the sculpture um, but he, that printing or that that act, that movement um, of of the execution of the finger on the on the 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 button and the button makes the lever and boom and onto the page. You 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 know you could, I I could think about that for a long time and, and kind of construct something else around around that. I think and I think it's very very interesting. Well, he makes zero and he makes Xeroxes of his type of, of his type's work, so he does pictures. Yeah, the Xeroxes, the Xeroxes, 
are also interesting because well in relation to the xeroxes he speaks about the fuzziness of the page the fuzziness of the of how the machine transforms the the xerox machine transforms the page and to give it this fuzziness this off register quality and he liked that he definitely liked that two typewriters yeah excuse me yeah, yeah. One was an Olympia and one was a Royal. One was green and one was blue. <laughs> yeah, there are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things. But I, I got slightly um, diverted. But Kate, in relation to the Stade, like the, the, for the they have the, an amazing holding of, of, of the works because when Rudy Fuchs was the, was the director, it was a very famous acquisition um, where he ostensibly acquired the, the entire exhibition. And it was, at the time, I understand, it was like the single largest acquisition that the Stadler had ever made. Um, and it's, it's really, really uh, impressive. And then shortly after that, um, Chinati got a series of Xeroxes um, that they have then on display in vitrines made by Judd. There is a very interesting thread that you could pursue in relation to the machine and, and then minimal, minimalist sculpture and, and some of the artists with whom he held great regard, Judd, Lewitt. Um, um, and, and the use of the typewriter and the poems, um, I, I think, and this kind of mechanomorphic or Human machine, I think, it could be could be something also to tease out. But as I said at the beginning, it's quite a long it's a long project, and I've already been working on it for two years, and it probably won't be ready until 2018. So there's lots of things to there's lots of avenues to explore. But it's a luxury to have such time to work consistently with an artist and to really drill into the work, which is something. It's fantastic. I know he went to boarding school with Frank Stella and Paul Scranton. I think they were all in the same class. Yeah, like it's amazing to think that. Did he ever mention that? Well, I think from the the the, the certainly the relationship with Stella is is a well documented and b still is very at the forefront of his his mind. Like he he really he had such respect and admiration for Stella and 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 um I, I, I it's it's quite endearing when you hear him uh, talk about that and and many many other artists but I think Stella is definitely you know and 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 Lewitt um You're welcome.